Trust the only payment solution developed for attorneys and recommended by 47 state bars. Law pay. One of a lawyer's worst fears is that a client, opposing counsel, and even a random stranger may try to physically hurt them, often for no more reason than the attorney doing his or her job. I'm Stephanie Francis Ward, and on today's episode of the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered, I'm speaking with Ty Smith. He's a retired Navy SEAL who founded Vigilance Risk Solutions, a security consultant business that focuses on workplace violence prevention. Welcome to the show, Ty, and you're calling from San Diego today, correct? Thanks for having me, Stephanie. Yes, I am calling from San Diego, California. Okay, great. So your website has some training videos about responding to workplace violence in the moment. And it seemed to me in watching the videos that a key part is trying to remain as calm as you can and maybe helping yourself get to a spot where you can make quick, sensible decisions in the moment. Can you talk to me about that a bit in terms of how one can do that when you're faced with something really scary? Absolutely. So the key to having the ability to respond in a tactically advantageous manner when you're being faced with workplace violence, you're in the thick of it. The key to that is what you do prior to that moment. And what I mean by that is mental preparation by way of training or thinking in a way that that we like to say is, if this, then what kind of training? If this happens, what am I going to do? Well, if that happens, how am I going to respond? The reason why that's important is because you don't want that situation to be the first time your brain is actually acknowledging the possibility of violence. So although the violence will probably never happen to you, your brain has to at least acknowledge the fact that it's a possibility beforehand. Because if you find yourself in the middle of the situation and you haven't done anything mentally to prepare yourself for the situation, that's when people end up with a deer in the headlights look and you freeze. It's the freeze component to fight or flight. So the most important thing that you can do beforehand is actually train, whether it be in-person training or web-based training regarding workplace violence, escalation of workplace violence, and de-escalating situations, using your brain to talk yourself out of a bad situation. Your video also mentioned that aspect of grounding oneself and maybe taking some deep breaths to steady yourself in that deer in the headlights moment. Can you talk to me a bit about that? For sure. So when you are in the middle of a situation that's as dynamic as workplace violence, meaning that it's continuously evolving, it's moving so fast that it could be over before you even acknowledge it's happening. The most important thing that you can do is remain calm. Oftentimes people are, once the violence starts, they're so shocked. It's so unbelievable that they forget to do something that we do without thinking about doing, which is breathing. So one of the most important things that you can do is breathe, take deep breaths and use positive self-talk to talk yourself through the situation, understanding that, hey, I have to be mindful that this is a really bad situation that I'm in. But as long as I breathe and I remain calm, I can work my way through this. Because if you don't have that positive way of thinking, if you don't breathe through the situation and keep yourself calm, that's when panic denial, disbelief sets in, and that's not going to serve you any good. Also, physical grounding is a really good technique that you can use, especially as an attorney where you may be sitting behind your desk and the customer or the client is on the other side of the desk. Once they start escalating the situation, if you're feeling yourself starting to become overcome by events, you can do something as simple as Take your hand and grab your desk as hard as you can. And what that does is it tricks your brain into understanding that the earth underneath me isn't moving and I'm steady. I'm here, I'm in this place, and everything is going to be okay. It sounds simple because it is simple, but it actually works. So it sounds like instead of thinking, oh my gosh, this isn't happening, this isn't happening, you should think, okay, yes, this is happening. I can handle it. Yes, because whether you acknowledge the fact that it's happening or not, if it's happening, it is happening. So disbelief and denial isn't going to do you any good. You have to be mindful of what's going on and you have to hit that acceptance phase of, okay, this is happening and I don't like it, but 
I need to stay calm and I need to use the most powerful defensive weapon that I have, which is my brain, in order to think through this so that I can get home safely at the end of the day. I think that sometimes when you practice law, some of your clients may not be very reasonable. Unfortunately, that's a part of the nature sometimes of people who need attorneys and sometimes other attorneys are not going to be very reasonable. Do you have any advice on determining, you know, is this person going to be okay? Or maybe should I end my business relationship with him or her because they may not be okay and I don't want to take that risk? Yes. So we are really, really, really big advocates of situational awareness and being aware of yourself, being aware of the people that are surrounding you, being aware of physical objects that are within your your environment, understanding what's going on around you at all times. And a part of that is being aware of the person that you're talking to, being aware of how that conversation went the last time you spoke with that person. What's the difference between this person's behavior when we're speaking on the phone and when we're speaking in person? How does this person respond to the information that I am offering them? Are they calm? Are they in tune with what I'm saying? Are they connected to me by way of eye contact? Because when it comes down to it, from the attorney's shoes, no one is going to take care of you as good as you can take care of yourself. Also, you have to be able to remove emotions from the decision. And that emotion is usually revolved around finance. Everyone has bills to pay. We all have a job to do so that we can pay our bills. But if that gets in the way of your personal safety, then it has to become a no-brainer. Maybe this client isn't a good fit for me. It doesn't mean that the termination of that relationship has to be blunt or in a way that it infuriates the client. But it could be as simple as, hey, listen, I don't think that I can do as good a job for you as you need because of your particular situation. Maybe I can introduce you to someone else that can someone that has a better way of communicating with you so that you guys are on the same page, or maybe you can go out and find someone that you believe would do a better job than me. But the most important part of that, of the termination of that relationship is that you allow the client to exit that relationship gracefully with dignity and respect. I think that that's very good advice. So I think I noticed a photo on your website and it was, it ties in with that, being aware of your surroundings and it had a young man headed inside what looked like a courthouse and he had a big duffel bag on his back. And on the one hand, I can think, well, you know, you may not even think anything about that, but maybe you should. Do you have thoughts on keeping your eyes open for things people might be carrying that are out of place, specifically like say at someone's office or maybe a courthouse? Yes. So that is a great picture. And that that picture is a really good example of how situationally aware of your surroundings are you? How aware are you when new people are entering your space? So I used to go to the Starbucks near my office all the time and I would walk in every day And there was a little bell above the door that would go off whenever I would walk in. And I would always look around and ask myself, hey, is the day, is today going to be the day that people are actually going to stop what they're doing, look up and acknowledge the fact that I just entered their critical environment. I just entered their space. And oftentimes I'm disappointed because people never stop looking at their cell phone. They never stop looking at their computer in order to just give me a cursory look to make sure that hey, I'm not someone dressed in all black walking into Starbucks with this huge tactical looking black duffel bag on my back and I stand out like a sore thumb. So think about it from the standpoint of that photo where where you just said, hey, it looks like he's walking into a courthouse. The way that individual was dressed and the bag that he was carrying, does it fit with that environment? So people have to be able to remove their heads from their devices is what we like to say and actually look around and notice, hey, is that person sticking out like a sore thumb because of the way they're dressed, because of what they're carrying, what's in their hands? If I look around at all the other people here, does that person match everything and everyone else in my critical environment or do they stand out like a sore thumb? And it all comes back down to situational awareness. 
Well, I think that brings up a really good point is I'm sure that in your line of work, you've probably developed a very good sense about people and what to expect. And I think attorneys would probably say that about themselves as well, um, particularly if they have a consumer practice where they represent individuals. Do you have any, and, you know, let's face it, especially like at the courthouse, you're going to see all kinds of people <laughs> with all, all kinds of things that might seem out of the ordinary. Do you have any advice or tips about maybe being open-minded about what might be unusual and what could be a threat and what wouldn't probably wouldn't be? Yes, that's a great question. So you're absolutely right. Attorneys deal with all kinds of characters, whether they're in their office, whether they are at the courthouse, having to visit jails in order to work with clients. They see all kinds of different people. The most important part, and you, you'll hear me say this over and over and over again, is that the attorney is situationally aware of everything that's happening within him or her or around him or her, actually watching people. Oftentimes, attorneys are so busy, they're walking, they're talking on the phone at the same time. They're walking and they're texting or emailing from a phone at the same time. So they're missing so much information that is happening around them. And you can't categorize people all the time based off the way they look. So they're going to see people that they're going to assume are, man, that's a pretty sketchy looking individual. And guess what? They might be right. But at the same time, that person in their brain could be a normal person. And hey, this is just how I look. This is just the way that I dress, but I'm a nice person, which means that even though you're taking in this information, you're looking at this person, you're saying, ah, oh, that person kind of makes me nervous. This person doesn't make me nervous. This person is, why are they looking at me that way? It doesn't mean that your perception is real. It doesn't mean that that person that you're looking at, assuming that they're a sketchy individual, doesn't mean that that person's actually sketchy. What's most important is that you actually acknowledge the information so that you are aware, because again, you don't want to be looking at your phone, writing an email, and then all of a sudden something happens and you look up and that's your brain's first time registering what is going on. So as long as you actually take in the information and go, okay, yeah, that person kind of looks kind of weird, but they're probably okay. But as long as I'm mindful of it, you're going to be all right. And I want to go back to something I'm curious about with you. If you are in a public place, are you usually, would you be writing an email or are you someone that you tend to stay off electronic devices while you're out in public so you can be aware of your surroundings? I love that question because it brings me back down to earth as well. <laughs> Listen, no, no one is immune to complacency. And personally, I think it's a really good thing. And, and this is why. Yes, you know, I, I'm a retired Navy SEAL. I, I did six deployments to the Middle East as a special, op special operations commando. I've got a lot of experience dealing with really bad situations. I see a lot of things on a daily basis in the United States, all over the world that I wish were different. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to change my belief that there is much more good in the world than there is bad, because I truly have faith in human beings. So I'm not going to allow the things that I've seen or experienced to cause me to become paranoid and fearful so that I can't live my life and enjoy my life because that's just not realistic. It's not healthy. And that's not what I want for you or for anyone else. So just like everyone else, I'm guilty of, Hey, I'm, I'm sitting in the park and I'm watching my dog run around, but at the same time, I'm doing work, I'm answering emails, or I might be scrolling through LinkedIn, seeing what my network is doing. But I'm mindful of the fact that, hey, I need to stop what I'm doing every once in a while, look up, look around me, make sure that everything's safe, make sure that my dog isn't you know, chasing some cat somewhere, and then I can go back to doing what's in my cell phone. But I don't want to be just locked into that device for five, 10 minutes straight without looking up and acknowledging what's going on around me. I see. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about carrying a gun for safety, whether that's a good idea and the responsibilities that come with that. We'll be right back. 
Did you know that attorneys who accept online payments get paid 39% faster on average than those using traditional payment methods? With LawPay, the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program, you can accept client payments online, via email, or in person, no equipment needed. Visit lawpay.com podcast to sign up and get your first three months free. And we're back. I'm Stephanie Francis Ward, and on today's episode of the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered, I'm speaking with Ty Smith, a retired Navy SEAL who now has a business that helps companies with workplace violence prevention. So, Ty, what do you think about lawyers getting guns to protect themselves if they haven't had any sort of law enforcement or security training previously? So... Like I stated, you know, I'm retired military. I have law enforcement experience as well. So I I am a red-blooded American man from the old school. I personally, I love guns. I I, I do. It doesn't mean that I'm a psycho about it, but that's me. That's who I am as a person. I believe that it's okay for myself to carry a weapon concealed as long as I'm on the right side of the law because of the amount of training that I have had in the past, and also because of the amount of training that I continue to do on a weekly or biweekly basis, even though I'm retired from the military now. So the most important component of that is training and experience. If an attorney believes that he or she should go out and get a concealed carry permit so that they can legally carry a firearm, I would say that that is okay as long as they are also pursuing really good training and on a very consistent basis. And I don't mean that, hey, go out and do a week's worth of training and at the end of the week, and a lot of people do less than that actually, but at the end of the week, then you get this certificate saying that you've been trained and now you have a concealed carry permit and you're good to go. That's it, you're, that's enough. You don't do any more training for a month, for two months. You have this permit, so now you can carry until the permit expires six months or a year from now. That is not okay. That is not enough training. Most people don't realize just how perishable of a skill shooting is, especially when you're shooting a pistol versus a rifle, something that you can tuck into your shoulder and the muzzle isn't going to move around as much. So just because you have a firearm doesn't mean that, you know, you can actually control the firearm correctly. What part of the skill would be perishable, like accuracy or something else? Everything. I I love that question. Everything about shooting. So when you're really talking about the fundamentals of shooting, there are seven different components that the average teacher will talk to you about. You know, they'll talk to you about basic stuff like grip, sight picture, breathing, stance. You know, it's really basic stuff. But it's not until you get into advanced training that the real problem comes into play. And that problem is, are you going to be able to remember all those seven fundamentals and everything that you did in training when all of a sudden your life is on the line? When your, your heart rate is, uh, it went from the average of 70 beats per minute to all of a sudden it's 140 beats per minute. You're feeling the effects of fight or flight coming on. Someone is actively trying to, to hurt you And all of a sudden your brain is going through, oh my God, am I going to fight? Am I going to flee or am I going to freeze? Because this happened so fast, I don't know what to do. Because it's very easy for someone to sit in, you know, a gun range and it's nice and cool. It's air conditioned. You're comfortable. No one's screaming at you. There isn't chaos around you. Most importantly, no one's trying to kill you. That's completely different when you're operating a weapon in that environment versus the complete opposite. So it's... It's a perishable skill in the way that, yeah, you can forget all of the fundamentals, but also when you're training in a gun range, you're not really getting the realism of someone trying to take your life. And now you're depending on this weapon in order to prevent that from happening. So the best way that you can simulate that is to just train so much that those seven fundamentals of shooting, you no longer have to think about them. They are ingrained in your brain. And now you're just going through the motions every time. So it sounds like and maybe if you were thinking about getting a conceal and carry permit, you should probably have an honest conversation with yourself about what you're comfortable with and the amount of time you have 
to train. I know I've heard that if you're going to carry a gun for protection and you're not prepared to shoot to kill to someone, if that if someone is trying to kill you, maybe you'd be better off without a gun. I agree. Because once you make the decision to fight, you have to commit to that decision, whether you like it or not, whether you have the proper amount of training or not. Once you decide to fight, you have to commit to that decision. So you can't carry a gun and say, well, I'm carrying it because in the event I have to protect myself, I'm going to shoot to wound. No, that that doesn't work. Also, <laughs> lawyers understand this. If you say that in court, eh, that might not go over so well. I'm shooting to wound. That's kind of like I'm purposely trying to torture someone. No, you have to commit to fighting in order to save your life or you have to run, which means that you shouldn't be carrying that weapon. Gotcha. So say you're an attorney who maybe is not comfortable carrying a gun and you are in an office building with security. What are some extra protections you can request from your security personnel and what's a good way to work with them? Like say you have a client who seems a little difficult. What's a good way to communicate with them for them to help keep you safe? Yeah. So I have a two-part answer to this question. First and foremost, having Security in your building is good, but at the same time, the attorney, he or she cannot outsource their safety and security to that contracted security because there's a lot about the contracted security. We don't know how much training do they have, how much experience do they have, what are their roles and responsibilities as security. They may not be responsible for actually interdicting themselves in the middle of a situation. Their roles and responsibilities within their contract may only be to report. So they may only be required to go, well, something bad's happening. I'm not going to put myself in the middle of it. I'm just going to call the cops and tell them something bad is happening. So attorneys can't outsource their safety and security to others. They have to take it upon themselves to make sure that they do everything possible to protect themselves. And if they're lucky, then the security is going to help But if I were them, I would assume that they are not. So it's up to me to protect myself. The other side to that is try to use those guys and gals as much as you can. So if you know that you're working late and it's dark outside and maybe you didn't put any thought to that prior to parking your car and maybe you parked your car in in a dark place and there's no light around, ask the security to escort you to your vehicle. Don't go it alone. If they're there, use them. If you're setting up for a meeting with a client and you know that either, hey, this client has a tendency to become irate or you know that, hey, I'm about to have a really difficult, uncomfortable conversation with this client. I don't know how they're going to react. I don't know them well enough. I'm a little nervous. Talk to security ahead of time and and let them know, hey, listen, I'm about to have a meeting. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I'm a little nervous. Can you guys at least be on standby to help me if I need it? Some security guards may even, they may even hang out outside of your office and listen, you know, for screaming in case you you need somebody to come through there immediately. Or you can prep your secretary so that they can get that person to run into the office as quickly as they can. But just talk to them ahead of time. You know, you don't have to give away client attorney information, but just let them know, hey, I'm nervous about this. Can you be on standby in case I need help? And do you have any advice, say you're an attorney who represents consumers and you have a storefront office because you want to get the free advertising from the foot traffic, but good or bad side is that you could draw a lot of people with that and some of them are going to be unusual probably. Do you have any advice on having a storefront office in terms of staying safe? Yes. So it would be absolutely unreasonable for me to say, hey, from a security standpoint, I don't think you should ever have a front office because again, live your life, be happy. There's no need to be fearful and paranoid, but understand that if you have a storefront office, understand what you're going to get with that. You're absolutely right. You may have strange individuals walk right in off the street from time to time. Again, being situationally aware of the situation of your environment at all times, it can be very, very helpful. So if you have that front office and you got these huge windows up front that you can see out of, Spend time looking outside of those windows from time to time. Don't just be glued to your computer screen and and not ever look up to see, hey, what's happening right in front of my face? What's going on in the parking lot? What are some of the people that walk back and forth 
in front of those windows look like? Do I ever see anything that would cause me to be nervous? Do I see anything that would require me to get on the phone and actually adhere to see something, say something? So I need to call the cops and go, hey, I just saw something that kind of looks weird, or it's making me nervous because it's right outside of my office. So being situationally aware of what's going on outside of that office is really important. And if you are in a low income area and you're actually worried about gun violence, you may want to invest in ballistic glass. You may want to invest in better locks and an alarm system for that storefront office. You may want to invest in access control. That way, people can't simply walk in off the streets. They have to be buzzed in after you speak to them from an intercom system. So there are things that you can do in order to to put risk mitigation controls in place. And again, the most important thing is that you're situationally aware of what is going on. All right. And that's everything we have time for today. I want to thank you so much for joining us, Ty. Anytime. And listeners, thank you for joining us as well. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. We'll see you next time for another episode of the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered.